Hello and welcome to Illini Drive. I am Eli Schuster. I'm joined alongside Isaac Trotter and producer Tati Perry. Tati? Hello, Illini drivers. Can you oh, call them drivers? My goodness. I like it. That's our fans? <laughs> our fans are called drivers? <laughs> Let's wow. go drivers. I love that. All right. So our fans are drivers. <laughs> the, the people who flip through the station when they drive home on their way to work. You guys are our drivers, I suppose. Um, we got a good show today. This is exciting. We got, a, we got a nice crew. We're a little short today. Brian Bins, usually here with us. Uh, right now, he's he's uh, not here on the show today. So we'll see. He could pop in. If he pops in, it's going to be exciting. But otherwise, it's the three of us, but that's fine. We have some good sports talk to do. We have a lot to talk about. Illinois football uh, has their game against Minnesota happening this Saturday. That is going to be their dad's weekend game. Uh, so plenty of fathers will be out. For, for that one. So that's always a good time. And uh, a lot of events going on this weekend for them as well. But in terms of other sports stuff, Illinois wise, I know volleyball's on the road this weekend. They'll be competing there. Illinois basketball, though, pretty big weekend for them. They have an exhibition game tomorrow night. And that kind of kicks off their season, or I'll say tips off their season to keep it in the basketball theme. That tips off their season. And uh, their first game of the season against Evansville is next Thursday. So things are really starting to creep up on us here. Illinois basketball right around the corner. And it doesn't it just it feels like it just it just happened. It's pretty exciting. Brad Underwood talked to the media today and he announced his starting lineup for tomorrow. And they're gonna go with Io Desumu, the the five star freshman to go along with Trent Frazier, Aaron Jordan, Georgie Bashanzavilli, and Kipper Nichols. And then I know you know, I'm so in, involved and enthralled in Illinois football right now, kind of in that right, the, in that mindset, so it's a little surprising that basketball's right here, but I'm really ready for it to get started. I am not enthralled in Illinois football. Not enthralled. I, I, enthralled I, is the wrong word. Or, or even it has like to have my mind on it. I think that uh, I, I think since about maybe week four, my mind's been like, eh, I'm not State. focused on this. I'm going to look towards After basketball. Penn State. Uh, maybe, no, maybe. I think it was Purdue I, for me. I, Probably. I don't, this is just me saying things. We don't actually have to pick a place where uh, the season completely fell apart. But <laughs> I think that uh, basketball uh, has always been something that uh, people have been looking forward to, rightfully so. Uh, a lot of new faces on that team. If you want a good breakdown of what to expect, you want to read about some of these new guys, maybe you don't know a lot about them, and you want to see what they're going to really offer to this this team, make sure you go to DailyIlini.com. Brian Benz, who again, he's on the show right now, but Brian Benz wrote a great uh Almost, I think it's a 2,000 word piece that breaks down basically everything you need to know heading into uh, this season with all these players. Uh, it's a good one, a lot of good information. Uh, it's fun to read. There's a lot of there's, there's a lot of uh, information that if you don't know, maybe about Alan Griffin or some of these other guys that haven't been spoken about as much as you've heard. Ayo Desumu talked about obviously. Tevian Jones has been talked a lot about, but there's. You know, a lot of new faces on this team, and he goes through each one of them. So uh, make sure you go read that. You can read that at dailyalani.com, or you can download the Daily Illini app in the App Store or on Google Play for Android. But before we get into Illinois basketball conversation, we could definitely talk about it a little bit today. Let's head into Illinois football. We got to get it out of the way. We're going to start with it. It's probably the worst topic. But <laughs> that's why we have it at the beginning. It feels like we have to do chores. And this is it, our it chore. Does. To get this is this our out chore. Covering this sport feels like a chore right now. Um, Illinois, obviously, without defensive coordinator Hardy Nickerson, he resigned uh, after the Maryland game. Um, Illinois now heads in against Minnesota with Lovey Smith calling the plays on defense. What should we expect in this game? It doesn't matter if it's offensively or defensively. I think just in terms of scoreboard, what we're looking at, how do we see Illinois matching up? There's going to be a lot of points. Both of these defenses are really not very good, and Illinois is giving up over 47 points a game in Big Ten play. Minnesota gives up over 40 points a game in Big Ten play. So I think both of these offenses will be able to move the ball up and down the field. I think you're going to see a wild barn burner. Really the difference in the game is which defense makes a play first. Illinois does a good job of taking the ball away. Minnesota doesn't. That's not really their strength. But Illinois also gives up more yards than Minnesota does. You kind of have that trade off there. So really, it really comes down to which defense steps up and makes a game changing play. Because, or even in special teams, because if a team gets a, a defensive touchdown or or a special team touchdown, that team's most likely going to win this game. Yeah, I think that for Illinois, I mean, we talk about you, you mentioned their their takeover ability, something that they've actually uh, been able to do this season, turn over the ball. Uh, and, and you know, Lovey Smith has finally installed that into his team. We, we've seen that um, come to fruition this season. So I think the biggest thing uh, this weekend, though, is they need to get that back because the past couple games they've lost that. And 
uh, you know, you need to to come in here and against a team like Minnesota, whose offense isn't necessarily um, that powerful. This team isn't that powerful, really. Uh, you need to be able to take the ball away. And the problem is, though, with your quarterback situation right now, you have A.J. Bush, who's going to be starting this game. And if something we've seen him be able to do really well the past couple of games is throw interceptions. And if you give one to Minnesota in this game, if you give their defense points in this game, Isaac, you talk about how important it is for Illinois to get the points, but if you give points to Minnesota's defense in any capacity, this this could easily be another loss. You can't get in, the, in a hole early, and that's a good point there. Illinois got off to a slow start against Wisconsin. Two interceptions early by A.J. Bush set the tone there. You're down 14 to nothing, and you, you kind of make some plays to get yourself back into it, but digging out of a 14-point hole was just too much. Same thing happened when A.J. Bush came in when you're down 28-9 to late in that first half. You had a chance to cut that deficit down a little bit against Maryland, throws an interception, kind of goes into the half with no momentum, and the game was basically over from that point. So I do agree with you. You talked a little bit about how this Minnesota offense isn't great, but I kind of disagree with you there. I think this Minnesota offense is very, very talented and one of the better ones in the Big Ten. Their quarterback, Tanner Morgan, was didn't start the season as a quarterback, but he came in and he threw for over 300 yards last week and three touchdowns and a win over Indiana. They have a very, very good running game without their top two running backs, which is kind of surprising. And then Tyler Johnson, their wide receiver, that's a guy that you should watch on Saturday because he's going to be playing in the pros. He leads the Big Ten in receiving. He has more receptions than Sam Mays, more receptions than Dominic Stampley, Ricky Smalling, and Carmani Green combined. I mean, that... He has 50 receptions this year for over 800 yards and eight touchdowns. He is an absolute stud, and he'll be a big-time problem for Illinois to watch out for this weekend. Yeah, I don't know how I, that stat. I don't know how surprising it is when really how terrible this Illinois passing attack sure. has been. Yeah. It's not. I think it's not that hard to kind of rack up, uh, uh, rack up these receptions, especially if you're if you're playing against an Illinois defense. But I think that with this Minnesota team overall, I mean, you know, three and five, four and four. Are they four and four? Okay, yeah. four and four. Head into it. They're a very similar uh, situation in the sense that this year was, you know, a lot of question marks. They're very um, young. They're a very young team. Yeah. And I think that while their offense has had upsides to it, I still think that for Illinois, this is a team where your running game uh, it should help you win this game. And you should win this game. I think that if anyone's going to talk about uh, if anyone's going to talk about a winnable game for the rest of the season, this is the most winnable game that you have left, and it's at home. And so I think that um, you know, when I talk about this Minnesota team and them not being as strong, I think when you compare that to the recent competition for Illinois, that's absolutely true. And I think that this is a this is a team that Illinois should be able to compete against. Look, this is the be- the best chance for you to pick up win number four this year for the rest of the year. Northwestern is better than Minnesota. Iowa is better than Minnesota. And then when you go play a team like Nebraska, they might have a worse record than Minnesota, but their offense has been better. So I, I, I do agree with you. This is the game that you have to have, and it's really the you know, the pivotal game of this Lovey Smith year just because you have to have four wins. You can't go into an offseason with three wins and say you have progress. If you double your wins in the offseason, you're four and eight. That's one thing. You, you go from two and ten last year to four and eight this year. That's a, that's a legitimate step of growth outside of all of the off-the-field issues. But, again, Minnesota does some things defensively that Illinois should be able to really move the ball against them. They do not tackle well. And if you've ever watched Reggie Corbin, you can know that he makes it really hard to tackle him. And they they do not tackle very well. They have a very odd defensive scheme where they kind of all filter you in one direction towards one player. And that one player this year has been their cornerback, who's not been very good at you know stepping up into that job and making making those tackles after their number one safety got hurt early in the season. So Illinois will have their chances to move the ball against this Minnesota team. You just need some impact from AJ Bush in this play, in this passing game because I don't know if you can just run the ball down the throat all of their t- all the time. And and you're gonna have to put up some points because this Minnesota offense is probably you know they're gonna put up about thirty guaranteed right away, and it's up to your offense to kind of figure that out. Yeah, I think that for this Illinois team, uh, you know, we talk about the passing game, and I think there's no situation really when you're a Big Ten team where you can just rely on the passing game for the entire game unless you're playing maybe a bad non-conference opponent. But when you're sitting in the Big Ten, you know, you obviously have a lot of teams that are run heavy. I mean, you look at Wisconsin, they played Wisconsin, that's that's kind of what they're all about. But Maryland is very run heavy. Maryland's very run heavy as well. I mean, Rutgers is was also Would relative has to be, be run heavy, but they're also run heavy. I mean, these are recent teams they've played, yeah. all run heavy. However, in recent game in in watching these recent games that you've seen Illinois and all of their quarterback quarterbacks have made plays, 
right against that Wisconsin game. Hornybrook made plays. Uh, Cassim Hill on Maryland, he ended had up best day of his <laughs> had, life. had his best game of uh, right. his career. So, um, you know, he has that. And, and so all these quarterbacks, regardless if they're good or not, have to make plays. And so for Illinois, we can talk about the run game all we want. We could talk about how they really need, the, you know, that's what they should focus on and they should run the ball. But at the end of the day, A.J. Bush is going to have to do something with his arm. And it's going to be key for for him to have a good showing. And you can't expect to see, you know, the two touchdowns, 216 yards. You just can't expect that, that he had in Maryland he because it came. That. No, yeah. he, it, it, you know, it came in, in a situation where he was playing against not all starting members he from got Maryland. He 140 yards of from Dominic Stampley, on from one guy on two plays, you exactly, say, and, and and that's a good that's a good point. And that's not him gunslinging it down the field. No. There was a little bit of a deeper pass in the second touchdown. The, second, to Dominic the Stampley. eighty-four yard touchdown was definitely a good throw deep down the field, but that's sure. just one throw. And 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 Dominic Stampley took that forty yards after the catch because there was nobody around him because they made a bad exactly. Throw. And so you're gonna have to throw the football, yes. and that's where the biggest point of concern comes for this Illinois team. I think in this game because you talk about the defense and when I've talked about the defense I've just kind of thrown that out the entire the most for most of the season because I don't think you're going to fix it. So it comes down again to a situation where you're going to have to play keep up. And that's what you're that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to play keep up because your defense can't get it done. And if AJ Bush can't throw the ball, then you're not going to be able to keep up. And that's where Matt Robinson might have to play a role this weekend if if AJ Bush continues to struggle because Rod Smith has shown time and time again if if they need a spark, he'll definitely go to the bench and find one. And, you know, it's not always all on A.J. Bush. These wide receivers have not helped out whoever's under center this year with multiple drops with Carmani Green and Sam Mays have had multiple drops. Ricky Smalling has failed to get separation and had multiple drops as well, too. So you got it's on it's on all aspects of this. You got to throw it a little bit better and you got to catch it a little bit better. And it seems so simple, but it's where you're at right now. When Trenard Davis is is kind of when you're watching the games, looks like the best wide receiver on your team and the most capable wide receiver on your team. And again, it's not trying to discredit him. He's made a lot of good moves. He's transitioned well into the role of, of being a wide receiver. But this isn't the most athletic guy. This isn't the quickest guy. This isn't the one that really should be looking like the best wide receiver on your team when you have people like Ricky Smalling uh, and Kermani Green and even Dominique Stampley, who decided to finally show up last game uh, a little bit, which I still don't take a lot from. Yeah, it'll be but, interesting to see what his role is this week. I know that he's going to definitely be more in the play play calling, but you're right. Trenard Davis is the only guy that can get open on a consistent basis. Trenard Davis isn't going to run away from you. Trenard Davis doesn't have that breakneck speed. He's not an amazing route runner. But he just finds ways to get open. And Illinois desperately needed Mike Dudek to be healthy this year. Unfortunately, he goes down early against Kent State. And that really hamstrings you, especially when you're talking about your two sophomores in Carmani Green and Ricky Smalling that have taken major, major strides backwards this year. And what I will say is, at least in, in terms of looking at Trenard Davis, is, you know, I don't know, I don't have the stats in front of me, but in terms of his yards after catch, Assuming it's not very high, this is the guy who, when he when he gets his hands on the ball, uh, usually he goes down right away, um, you know, or, or he gets tackled very quickly afterwards. He it may be leading the team because he probably is he leading the team in inter- or receptions. He's he probably leads, is leading the team, leads in the team in reception. So yeah. that's the only thing that could skew the stat. But in terms of when he's catching the football, no, he's the, not getting many yards after the, the catch. The person who leads after yards after the catch is Dominic Stampley. It's Dominic Stampley <laughs> now, yeah, for, exactly. For two plays. But Jernard Davis, I mean, when you watch him this season, he, he catches the ball, he goes down, and. That's that's completely fine, honestly, for me in this game, as long as A.J. Bush is connecting with him. Because for me, if it just goes a 5-yard, 10-yard pass, and it's Trenard Davis, and he just falls straight Move down, that's fine with me. Yeah. Do it, do it, you know, do it just methodically down the field. I don't care. But he's gonna, A.J. Bush is going to have to throw the football. And so if that means he has some sort of connection with Trenard Davis, fine, get it to him. But... You need to try and get some other people involved in this game. I'd like uh, to see Reggie Corbin be used in the pass game a little bit more. Sure. We saw it a couple wheel routes that have worked well. He had a 52-yard reception a couple weeks ago. You kind of want to see, against Purdue, you want to see more of that. I want to see Reggie Corbin find more ways to get him the ball because he's your best playmaker on the team. And it doesn't look like Mike Epstein is going to play this weekend. It doesn't look like you know guys like Tony Adams are going to be out, but especially with Epstein on sticking with offense. When you don't have a guy like that, and now you also don't have Dudek, and you really can't count on Carmani Green and Ricky Smalling right now, you have to be smart, and Rod Smith has to find a way to get Reggie Corbin the ball. I think Dre Brown has deserved more opportunities, too. He had a couple big, long kick returns against Maryland, and I think that he can do some things where they can yeah, do I don't some... Yeah, in the, in the, I don't know how much he'll add in the passing game, but... He, he's a good receiver. He, he is a good receiver. They just need to give him some chances to, to show that. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think there's... there's They're definitely still... Uh, 
reasons that we haven't seen some of these people that we name and, and then that they haven't shown up. And I think, you know, we can talk about um, we can talk about how we'd like to see Rod Smith make this move. But I think in terms of offensively, uh, Rod Smith has, has made the right moves. I mean, he's, he's doing what he needs year. to do. I mean, yeah. he's the best he's the best coach on this team right now. And so um, he's making the moves that have to be done. But I think that, it, you know, you it, when we look at Dominic Stampley, this is a situation where if you can get him involved in any way, I mean, that's going to just open up the, the the field so much for your team because then you have to start focusing on him a little bit. And even if that means doing what you did, what which gave Dominic Stampley his two touchdowns in Maryland, which at least on the first one was just basically, uh, what was it, a quick slant on the first one? No, so... Or the second one was, was a RP- longer slant. And yeah, that he was a he route, yeah. yeah. And but I think w- whatever it was, it was basically a dump off pass to, to Dominic Stampley. And if that means that's what you're doing with him this game, then do that with him. Get him the ball with chances in the open field to make somebody miss. Because there's not many guys on the team that have the yards after catch ability that we've been talking about, like Dominic Stampley does, and that's where Stampley's impact can be really used. And that's the offensive side. I feel like we talk so much offense, and it is really important, but they've been pretty solid this year defensively. The big thing that I'm watching is just, is there any difference? I said, we may, I said, I, I mean, I said why we don't talk difference? about defense. There's just no reason to talk about defense. But I think this week we have at least something to look for. Just if, if Lovey Smith makes a difference, are they doing different things fundamentally? Or are they going to sit back and do what they've done all season long and continue to get gas? Sure, I think if you have a storyline, anything, if you have any storyline uh, about the defense this season, it would be for, for this weekend, just because of the fact that Lovey's call, calling the plays. And obviously there's a difference because, you know, they're, they're without Hardy now. And you got to see how the guys respond to that and how, and how is Lovey going to manage this game possibly differently than what you saw uh, saw Nickerson do. And so that's that's what's going to be interesting to see this weekend. But I think, um, I, I still think that in terms of talent and preparation on the field, I don't know how much can change in, in a week. And it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see. But in terms of previewing it, talking about it, there's really not a lot to add there other than Lovey's calling the plays now and we'll we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, the only thing I could think of is maybe some personnel changes. And and Lovey Smith and Hardy Nickerson had worked so hand in hand. So I doubt that there's going to be some major personnel thing. I'm looking at injuries too. I want want to see if Tony Adams is back from his hamstring injury and he can play because you need him at safety badly. Uh, like we saw last week, Stanley Green can't really play for you right now with his, with his speed and with his inability to you know see things and 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 understand what's going on and break down offenses and understand what he needs to be doing. So uh, you need Tony back. It's interesting to see if if Daley Harding is back and and if you can get some more you know any improvement from this defensive line because no defensive line, no defense, and that's kind of what it's been like all season long. Yeah, and I think that. You know, we we can mention too how there's certain guys that we want back, but the problem is even when they were in, it wasn't there wasn't a massive difference, and so it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting if at least one massive change, which is the absence now of Hardy Nickerson, if that does anything, because I think that's the last this is the last kind of box to check if anything can be done to change this to change this team, and if 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 he's gone and this defense looks the same this this week then there's nothing you can do, I think, for the rest of the season. That, that means that there's no way to change this until basically the uh, offseason preparation. Yeah, and that's a, the thing. This is a huge game for Illinois, not just on the field-wise, but off the field-wise. You have a lot of recruits coming in for this one. Shaman Cooper, your number one guy on your board, is coming up to look, watch this game again. And you had a lot of recruits that came for Purdue, and they watched you get beat 46-7. to You need to go out there and show a better performance today because you have got to fix this in recruiting. That's the only way that Illinois can improve – this team is is through recruiting, and you got to put a, a better performance on the field this week. Yeah, they have a, the, the the Illinois team has a a big time uh, move that they can make this weekend by at least doubling the win total that they had last season and uh, showing up for some of the recruits that are there. So possibly they can double it again <laughs> next season. So uh, we will be right back when we get back. We'll talk a little bit about Illinois basketball, and also we're gonna have to talk a little bit about a, a Chicago native, Derek Rose, who who had a pretty good performance in the NBA last night. So we're gonna give our thoughts on that. But make sure you stick with us. Uh, you're listening to a line I drive here on 107.1. WPGU. Welcome back to Illini Drive here on 1071 WPGU. I am Eli Schuster. I'm joined alongside Isaac Trotter and producer Tati Perry. Tati? What up? Always good. Always good. Good. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter if the it's a what up. The delivery of that is just fantastic. It doesn't matter what she says. It's always fun. It's always great. But we do have a topic coming up that I think she's she's going to comment on. 
I think that this this Derrick Rose conversation we're gonna have, I I feel like she's got a comment on. But I might have a few. All right, she might have a few words. All right, that's all I needed here. All right, before we get into that though, we're gonna talk. Uh, we'll talk some basketball. But we're gonna talk some college basketball. College basketball season is right right around the corner, starting up next week. It's gonna be really exciting to see. And Illinois though has an exhibition game uh, tomorrow night, and it's gonna be a fun game. It's gonna be fun to see. They play Illinois Wesleyan. A team that uh, that is a very solid <laughs> Division Three program. Sure, yeah, <laughs> but at the end of the day, they're a Division Three program. Yeah, this and is great. This is almost as big for Illinois Wesleyan. This is bigger for Illinois Wesleyan than it's sure. for Illinois. Yeah, they're yeah, so yeah. excited to come down here and got a couple local kids. Corey No from Muhammad Seymour, who's just around the corner here. He'll he's on the uh, Illinois Wesleyan roster, and then also Doug Wallen, the leading scorer of all time in Champaign County basketball. He played at Champaign Central with Tim Finke. He is also on the court there, so you can get to watch them play tomorrow. That's what you get from a local right there. Yep. Someone <laughs> know it. Been here. Know it that. all. Who's that, uh, playing at Illinois Wesleyan? But uh, no, it's gonna be it'll be a fun game to watch, and uh, and Illinois is is. is especially when looking at exhibition games, you know, a lot of times kind of people throw them away. Um, but this is especially interesting this season because this is going to be the first time that you're basically seeing your entire team because Illinois, majority of Illinois team uh, is all fresh faces, all new faces. And so tomorrow is going to be a lot of fun to, to watch some of these new guys. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have, you know, if you have four guys back and Trent is back and Kipper's back and DeMonte's back and Aaron Jordan's back. And we kind of know we get in those. But Andres Feliz is someone I'm so excited to see. Of course, I'd assume it was going to be fantastic to see Georgie Bashanchevili. His energy has been so evident. He, he's great in the, you know, those interviews after after practice. But you want to see him on the floor. And that's our first chance to really see him go up against some other competition and, and and see what he has. And I'm also interested to see Samba Kane and, and Tevian Jones and Alan Griffin. Like, there's just so many good things to see from this team. And, you know, we don't know a lot about this team. We have ideas, but tomorrow's our first chance to really get to see a little bit of what to expect when the regular season rolls around. Well, you're going to see, too, the nice thing about this exhibition game is you're going to see everybody. I mean, you, you, you're most like, you're going to see everybody that's not injured right now, and that's going to be the, the most exciting thing, and that's why these exhibition games are always worth it. because And they're going to go out there, and they're going to want to win. They're going to want to play. I mean, uh, at least for the guys that were on the team last year, uh, you know, you lost your exhibition game at, with Eastern Illinois. and so that's pretty embarrassing, <laughs> and, too. Oh, yeah, and, and I mean, in, you know, and again, that's that's a, kind of a fluke game. Trent Frazier played probably the worst game that he'll ever play in college during that game. And I remember that was an interesting. I was there for that game. That was not a broadcasted game. It was just a game that was uh, that Illinois and actually a great idea that Illinois and Eastern Illinois did for hurricane relief uh, at the time. And uh, all the proceeds went there. Uh, a lot of fun to go. But and you you did you know you learned a decent amount about the team early on. But then it also shows you that uh, exhibition games may not matter that much because Trent Frazier became the best player on your team. And Trent Frazier looked, I rem- from what I remember, terrible in that game. But Trent Frazier surely didn't look like the second best freshman in the Big no, Ten. No, Trent, Trent Frazier in that game, I remember, the, the, the part I remember most vividly about that game is Trent Frazier, I, I, what shot he missed exactly, that I don't remember, but he was coming off the court and he was taken out very quickly. Brad Underwood stormed. He was storming, pacing so fast up and down the sideline, was just waiting to to be able to take Trent out of the game. He calls and takes Trent's out. Trent starts heading back over to the sideline. Underwood has his face almost pressed against Trent as Trent is walking back, and Trent is is head down. He looks super sad, and I think it was Kipper that comes over, and he's trying to pat Trent on the back and keep him warmed up and, and, and kind of tell him to shake it off. But it didn't matter while Kipper was standing there. Brad was still right in Trent's face, screaming at him, I and it looked like every Trent was. Second of that. And it looked that is like, fantastic. <laughs> and it looked like Trent was about to break down crying. And I remember sitting there, and I felt so bad for the kid. But that just it just showed you if you're you're Brad Underwood, it doesn't matter if you're a freshman, it doesn't matter if you, if you're an upperclassman, whatever it is, he's going to get in your face and he's going to test you. And that's exactly what he did. And I think that's probably why you saw the production that you started to see out of Trent Frazier in that season. I would hope that Brad Underwood doesn't have to do that to anyone tomorrow. Would I be shocked? Absolutely not. Okay, so, let's yeah. talk about how uh, we hope he doesn't have to. But you know, even if uh, Trent Frazier hits a three, he doesn't like. He's going to do that. That's just the guy that Brad Underwood is. <laughs> if, right. if there's a shot that goes in that he doesn't like, doesn't matter. If you head back to the sideline, you're getting a mouthful. So Brad Underwood is always angry. He has a word for <laughs> and you, I think. He always. Has, no, always. And, and and he'll he'll scream at you uh, even if you make the shot. If it's something he didn't like or maybe, it, it, you know, it didn't go in the way he wanted, he's going to let you hear it. And and 
I don't mind that. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of fun, and it makes for a great exhibition game. So that's why people should go because you could, you can could see these type of moments that are a lot of fun. What would you make of Brad Underwood coming out today and and announcing the starting lineup? I felt like it was pretty much what I expected. I had thought Demonte Williams would be in the three there instead of AJ, but Aaron Jordan starting at the three makes perfect sense to me. I think those two guys are kind of interchangeable for me. And but other than that, the other four seemed you know like I expected the other four. I mean. Honestly, I, I don't take much away from it. I think that this could be a, a different starting lineup than you see next week against Evansville. So I, I don't think that um, that this starting lineup necessarily tells you what they're doing next week. Um, you know, next week you could see Demonte Williams in the starting lineup. Or you may Andre not Spilies. see, yeah, you may not see Io start next week. I mean, it's just a situation where y- you can't take much away. It still is an exhibition game at the end of the day. Um, it doesn't. It's not going to tell you uh, a ton about the personnel right. in terms of You'll what he's doing. You'll see a ton doing. of lineups tomorrow. So. Too. Yeah, I mean, no, exactly. I mean, you're gonna and you're gonna see some strange ones. You're gonna see plenty of weird looks because it's a time for you to test things out. What so the weirdest look who you think we'd see tomorrow? The weirdest look we'd see tomorrow? I mean, it would Zach be Zach Griffith will be on the court, the walk on, <laughs> Drew Casey, Tyler Underwood, Samba Kane, and Georgie Bashant. Sure, done. I didn't even think about <laughs> I didn't even think about the walk ons, but yeah, I mean, you had to throw the walk ons in there. But at the end of the day, I mean, the exhibition lineup, you know, starters, whatever, right. doesn't matter a bunch. Um, you know, what is going to matter is these players getting out on their home court and just playing some basketball in front of fans and, and seeing what guys respond to that, uh, seeing what guys have those big moments. And it's going to be, it, it, it'll be telling in some ways, but also at the end of the day, still an exhibition game. Doesn't mean a whole lot. I think that there's a few things that you can count on. And last year when we saw earlier in the year, especially in some of those exhibition games, they still didn't really know what they were doing offensively. And you could see that they were still kind of wondering what Brad's uh, Brad Underwood's system and scheme is. And you have four guys back now that played a lot more, and you have two others off the bench who would help there. So they're kind of a little bit more familiar with the scheme. But with all these new faces, you're still kind of I think you're still going to see some of those growing pains. I just want to see if Brad Underwood's offense has a little bit more balance to it. It was very vanilla at times last year, and Brad Underwood admitted that, and I want to see if he is he's kind of expanded that a little bit more now that it's a second year with the program and has a few guys around that, that are back and can kind of get a better understanding of it, and I think it'll be really exciting to see what, what he dials up tomorrow night and what he shows in an exhibition game. Yeah, I think that you will, you're going to, for, for Illinois, I think you're going to see a better balance off the bat than you did last year in terms of offensive play. Because and continuity. Of the f- Sure, but I think because at the end of the day, when you're looking at the situation that Illinois was in last year, where you had guys that were used to one system and now had to adjust to fit the other, but uh, and, and you know that could be hard to do, and that takes a while to do, and that's why guys end up transferring. In this situation, you got guys that fit your system. I mean, you know, you you recruit guys that fit your system, so they're going to come in, and, and they're also fresh, and they don't have in the back of their head, they don't have this kind of older system that they're going to because. Either way, when a freshman comes to college, they're not thinking about, oh, what did I run in high school? They're, they're, they're this new. This is all I know. This, is, oh, this yes. is a fresh mind. And so that's why you're going to see, I think, right off the bat, just a better flow from this team altogether, but especially offensively, because you're right. Last year, there, you know, uh, the biggest talking point for Illinois basketball was, oh, Brad Underwood, oh, he's got that. You shoot the ball in seven seconds offense, right? And then you see the first handful of games, and you're like, they're holding this ball like it's John Gross time, and, and they're, not get, they're not getting rid of this ball at all. They're holding it right down to the wire. And, and you know that just makes Underwood's blood boil. And so what I think you're going to see this year is you'll finally see him go back to that, where you're getting the ball up to the basket you know, in the first seven seconds, something he likes to do, and so you're gonna see you're gonna see a really quick moving offense, and I think these guys are way, way more well built for that. Yeah, I think that athletically, Illinois has improved leaps and bounds compared to last year. I mean, you didn't have an athlete like Tevian Jones on the roster last year. Alan Griffin is another wing that you have that's big time athleticism, and those guys might be your ninth and tenth ones off the bench. That's how deep this team could potentially be at the wing and at the guard spot. So I, I'm very excited about this team. I, I don't know if they're going to have a better record than what they had last year, but I do think that they'll be much more competitive. And going up against some of the big time you know, big time programs like Georgetown and Gonzaga and Iowa State, and if you ended up playing in Auburn or something in Maui, those are good experiences for these young guys. And it, it all gets started tomorrow, and I can't wait. And you know, I, I'm really excited to just see get a first glimpse at some glimpse at some of these freshmen so that in a couple months from now when we're comparing to be like man remember how bad Alan Griffin looked in that in that in in that scrimmage against Illinois Wesleyan like you can kind of see a little bit more and there've been good reviews about this team based on what they did in the Vanderbilt closed scrimmage playing against top-notch competition they were able to hold their own and and that's a good good sign 
I think that the biggest, another another huge difference from this team to last year's, and I brought this up before on the show, is you you, you know Underwood talks about one obviously being everyday guys. Uh, that's kind of the the slogan now that has surrounded the, the Illinois basketball. No, no, no. <laughs> no <laughs> Everyday la- guys. No ladders. And so that's that's obviously been key. But also he wants winners, right? He talks about how key that is to understand that that you know you don't want to lose in culture, which is what the kind of famous quote was last year before the season started, talking about how these guys didn't really know how to win. And when you get all of these fresh faces, you get these this new look team. Uh, you at least you, you gain guys that in in their high school days. All they know is a winning mentality. I mean, that's all it is. It matters. And so, and even when you go back to the guy that's sitting, you know, on your bench, like an Alan Griffin, who, who, you know, right off the bat's not going to get a ton of playing time, he's still a winner. I mean, this is a guy that still comes off the bench as a a guy who, who in his head, has a winning mentality, and that just creates a whole different dynamic for your team. And so, you know, you don't have guys that have been plagued by losing. And even if this season, which I, I, I agree with you, Isaac, I don't know if this team's going to be able to surpass um, the win total from last year, especially because of the hard non-conference schedule that they have this year. But it doesn't matter because at least if you lose, if you have a losing record this season or, you know, you are just not playing well this season, I don't think that's going to transfer in to the next season as strongly as it would with, uh, the times that we saw that the past couple of years, just because these guys the entire year, I think, are going to play really, really hard. Yeah, and they, they are going to play hard, and they're not fighting for your culture this year. And you're but not they are fighting have, in practice. Eh, that's good. <laughs> uh, but you're not. You're kind of not nip, nipping at each other's heels a little bit more like we saw last year. There was tension on that team. There was tension between Brad Underwood and you know Michael Finke. There was tension between that was Tijon clear. Lu- <laughs> there was tension between Tijon Lucas and Mark Smith and Trent Frazier. They, that vibe. Those three didn't really get along that well all the, all the time. So there, there's some things there. Greg Iboigbedin was another one that had some tension, and I don't know if you're necessarily going to have these issues. Sure, it's really easy not to have tension when you're 0 and 0, and you haven't had a loss yet, and you haven't gotten spanked by Purdue or Wisconsin or some time like that. But eventually, when when you're bonding like this right now, and when you're together, and when you're you're playing with guys that know how to win. During those hard times, you're not going to be pointing fingers, and I think that that's going to be a, 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 a that's going to be why this team is going to be a little bit better than what they were last year. That's why Brad Underwood's culture matters so much, because in those hard moments, if you start to point fingers like we saw last year, your entire season corrodes. I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen this year. What is your if if you had to think about it? What's your your hottest take that you could give on this Illinois basketball season? The most scorching take that you could give. Okay, so I have a really basketball. high bar because last year I had I was all aboard the Mark Smith is going to be Big Ten Freshman of the Year, um, <laughs> and that was not that even a hot take. That well. was for you. That was just something that you believed wholeheartedly. <laughs> that, well, yeah, right, hot take, man. Okay, here's, hot, here's take. one. All right, here's the one. Georgie Bashan Shavili will not lose the starting center spot to Adonis De La Rosa. I think when Adonis comes back, that's not scorching hot. I, I'm sorry, I, that's okay, not scorching right, hot. I got to step my, got to step up my. I think because the thing is, I think you can make a, a good enough case for that, and because of the it, and, and I'll tell you why that's not scorching hot okay. to me is because of the fact that he's going to get a bulk of playing time at the beginning of the year, and uh, and it's not like he has one or two games. He's going to get a good amount of playing time uh, before uh, Adonis is ready. While he, Adonis may be coming back sooner than we think, he's still going to have a couple games to get to, uh, probably beforehand. three weeks of games. That's, exactly, that's which is a lot. So I think that and you know if he plays well within those three. Why not? He could definitely earn that. So I don't know if that's scorching hot. Okay, so I should. I have to step up my. I game. think you got to step up. All right, game Alan Griffin's going to lead Illinois in three point shooting this year. That's my scorching hot take. Okay. As the tenth man off the bench or fifth man off the bench. <laughs> All right, I'm pulling another team. I'm pulling. Uh, I'm pulling Tati into this. I want. I want to know a hot take that you have for Illinois basketball. Hey Tati, does Tevian Jones finally learn how to wear the right length of pants? Ah, oh, that drives me insane. His pants. But anyway, that has nothing to do with Tevin Jones is six foot eight. He has extremely long legs. His sweatpants are not long enough for his legs. I've seen that. I've noticed that. I feel like he needs to talk to you. It's a style thing. Maybe it's a style thing. If we can get him on the show, maybe we'll just talk about his pants. (laughs) Yeah, just only pants talk. Um, I think a hot take. I think uh, right now, Kipper is the most athletic um, on the roster, but I I think he can be surpassed um, quickly. By, I don't know. I don't know necessarily by whom, but I don't. Th- I think Tevian. he's gonna fall. <laughs> Tevian is the one. Tevian so you're basically saying you don't. You don't think. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that Kiver could be the best player on the team this year. And I don't the most think he's gonna be ready. You don't think it's gonna happen. 
I think right. he's gonna fall. I, but not like for any other reason besides I think that these besides young guys, it's a hot take and you need something. Yeah, <laughs> I think these young guys are just. He still knows the losing culture. Um, and Ooh, I like this. Um, the way you guys are talking, and from what I understand, I don't follow basketball as closely as I follow football. Um, I do think that because he's complacent in the losing culture that I don't know if he will excel into the winning culture as well as the others will. I, I like that. Really, this is why this this hot take stuff could be good. That's a Throwing really in good, a good thing that she there. brings in there, though, because Brad Underwood has been all over Kipper Nichols in practice about being consistent every single day, every single practice. And if Alan Griffin and if Aaron Jordan or if DeMonte Williams or if Tevian Jones, like he has four wings there that he can really trust. And if they're more consistent than Kipper and Kipper slacks off for even a little bit, Brian Underwood's going to be right on Kipper's butt right away. And and that's that's a really good that's a really good observation from our our producer. Okay. I'm going to give I'm going to show okay. you too how oh, the hot okay. takes are done. <laughs> he said he said time to <laughs> stew over this one. I'm so going to show you how it. the hot takes are done. All right. I'm going to say there's one player on this team that heads into the NBA draft after this season. And it's <laughs> it's going to be Trent Frazier. Trent Frazier has an incredible year shooting the ball. He just leads this team into the into the NCAA tournament. Oh my gosh, right. I'm more they, fired up that Illinois is in the NCAA tournament <laughs> compared they, to the Trent's in the NBA. And, yeah, he leads them into the first round of the NCAA tournament. They win a first round game. They get knocked out in uh, in the round of 32. And and Trent Frazier says I'm leaving, and he has and he has the end of the draft. If that so happens, that's great for this Illinois program. That's <laughs> I know, right? Awesome for the program. I that's just thought cool. I'd leave it on a positive note. I mean, first we have this weak weakness that is Isaac's Georgie is going to be the the start of the whole year over a dot. I mean, that's, true. that's that's weak. That's not that's that's this a weak true. hot take. I got my hot take game got better. Sure, it got better. It's a lukewarm. So your hottest take <laughs> was the take on. Mark Smith. I thought that Mark, wasn't even a hot take. I thought Mark Smith was going to be God's <laughs> gift to basketball. I did next not. Year for Let me tell you, the whole time I was anti Mark Smith. Well, you should have been producing our show last year so that you could have been <laughs> yeah, you talking me you off the ledge. You could have said this. I went to the high. I graduated the same high school as Mark Smith, and I have so seen she him can play. bash on him twenty four seven. Yeah, that's my thing. Um, no, I I'd seen him play, and I I mean, yeah, he had a great senior year, but the other ones, there was a reason nobody knew who he was, and so you know. Gosh. Have fun in Mizzou. <laughs> wow. wow. She's throwing this the shade. Is, this is awesome. This is the most Tati's I ever way, talked on the show. By the way, I wanted to ask you, Tati. Mark Smith gets that waiver by the NCAA to be immediately eligible at Missouri this year. How big of an how excited are you for bragging rights now? Mark Smith, Jeremiah Tillman versus Trent Frazier and this whole crew. I don't think Tillman and Smith are gonna work well together at all, anyway. I could so believe I could understand that. I, yeah, let's I start there. And so I think bragging rights will be a tragedy, and I can't <laughs> wait to watch. I think that uh, no, I think that's a good point. Actually, I do think that uh, Mark Smith playing now actually might not be the best thing for him. I think that you he know, if, year. I think if he sat out a year, uh, just kind of marinated, learned under this Mizzou team, and was able to come out next year and, and kind of uh, really start the way a lot of people thought he would, um, that would be great for him. I think heading into what happened at Illinois for him and you know how how much he struggled here to just going kind of to the the big rival school and playing right away I just can't see him putting together a fantastic season of any kind or really a really good season of any kind and I understand this and this team's going to be relying on him a lot especially with Jonte Porter I was who, just going to bring that up yeah which especially with Jonte Porter who's now out for the year because I guess these these Porter brothers can't learn how to <laughs> stay healthy but <laughs> i'm it, never it, gonna bash on him that's <laughs> terrible that's a tough break for him i'm not bashing i'm oh, just saying they not. can't learn it, it's it's rough for the for for both of them but this this both of these guys and this family just can't seem to uh to stay healthy and that they're gonna be relying really heavily on before even mark smith got that waiver jeremiah tillman but now it's gonna be mark smith so two guys that illinois had <laughs> they had Jeremiah Tillman. People don't forget that he decommitted. They the two guys they had, and those are the two they're going to be relying on. And so I think that with Mark Smith though, um, he was really bad last year. I mean, he played really bad last year, and it's because he didn't fit Underwood's system well at all. And he could definitely fit into Mizzou's a lot better. But it's concerning how how poor he played last year. I don't think that fitting into a system helps you guard defensively. Because that's what Mark Smith could not do last year. He did not move his feet very well. He did not didn't move laterally very well. 
And, you know, we can all talk about the system, but the system was fine for him early in the year when he was averaging 24 points a game through the first five games. So there, there are instances where Mark Smith's system was, was absolutely fine. The, the real reason why Mark Smith didn't work out is because Trent Frazier got better in a hurry. And Trent Frazier took every single thing that Mark Smith was promised during the recruiting, during that entire process, Mark Smith was promised, say, you're going to come in and be the lead guard and do what Trent Frazier did. You can be a Big Ten player of the year. That's what Trent Frazier came in and did. And Trent Frazier took that. Mark Smith kind of lost that job because of Trent Frazier's emergence. Sure, but you can't say that uh, part of that doesn't lend itself to the fact that Trent fits way better with this type of Underwood system than Mark Smith does. Mark Smith is slow. And Mark, I mean it. It's true. I'm not. I'm not bashing the guy. Mark Smith is a slower player. Uh, he's also a guy who does not shoot nearly as well as Trent does. And I think that was on display last year when he would try to pop some of those threes confidently that that weren't going to be that he wasn't going to be hitting them. Confident out of his and hand. What he should have been doing is driving to the basket a little bit right. more because he's good under the basket, but he wasn't doing that very often. But I think you know we can't just throw system out of it because I think the biggest reason Trent surpassed him was because he fit. Underwood system really well. Underwood system brings out the best, I think, in what Trent Frazier can do as a basketball player. Sure, and, and Brad Underwood worked with Trent Frazier really well. But at the beginning of the summer, when Mark Smith got here, he killed Trent Frazier every single day. Every single day in summer. It started through the beginning of the year. He was killing him, too, during the time. Like, yeah, dur- during a but year that from also now, didn't, last year. Yeah, but, but things changed, and things changed in a hurry. And I, I really have a hard time thinking it was only the system that was the issue there. I think that there's a lot of other things. Mark Smith's dad plays a, a role in this. Mark Smith mentally plays a role in this. Sometimes, sure, there's sometimes a lot. Mark Smith there's a lot got of stress. beaten down and did not come back up. Yeah. I think it yeah. was he got his he's he lost his position. Um, Underwood was constantly in his face, constantly yelling, whatever. Treadmill. But he's he's a coach. Uh, he's gonna yell. Um, and it was just it was constant. Um, everybody had gassed him up, and then he didn't perform as well, and then it just deflated his ego. So Hundred percent. There's a lot that goes into it. I'm very interested it, to see how he sad. fits into Missouri. Because is he going to be the ball dominant point guard that they're going to have? I think he's going to have to be now that John Tay's oh, out, yeah. and now that I mean it's going to be him and Kevin Purrier, who's a pretty solid player. They have a couple other wings that are decent, and Jeremiah Tillman. He's going to probably have to play point guard because their point guards graduated last year. So I'm interested to see how that'll work and if he continue to grow. Because let's be honest, if Mark Smith goes out and has a really good year, we're not going to be shocked. He's a he has the athleticism to be a good player eventually. He works way, way better on a Mizzou team than he does, I think, this Illinois team. And that's what I think it comes down to. Yes, there was a lot of psyche that went into it. There was a lot of just bad situation that went into it. A lot of kind of him being young-minded in the sense that he wasn't able to bounce back from what of some of these struggles that and obstacles that were in his way when he came here because he was held on a pedestal. But I still think, uh, you know, if you don't mesh well with what your team's trying to do— um, it's not going to work out for you. And so I just think scheme-wise and and really running uh, an offense, he can do that much better with Mizzou. And also he could do that much better in an SEC program than he can in the Big Ten. Because what we learned was that Mark Smith cannot compete at this at that point in time last year. And I still probably think this year it would have been a good chance. He just can't compete with the big athleticism that's in the, the Big Ten. Yeah, and I think that... We'll we'll find out a lot about Mark Smith's game and how he if it really was the system this year. I think that'll be really evident to see how he how he fits in. And I wouldn't be surprised if Mark Smith goes down to, to Missouri and is a top you know a double figure scorer for them. I I just won't just because they're. I don't think people should be. The opportunity is there. The shots are going to be there, and he meshes really well with Conzo Martin because Conzo Martin's not a screamer and not doesn't really require you to play defense and doesn't require you to be a team player. That's just how. It <laughs> oh works. wow, that's that's I'm cutthroat. Just, I'm, no. I'm just I'm kind of I'm just kind of kidding there, but. I, It'll be fun. I'm ready for bragging rights to get here. And I'm glad that basketball's here because even if Illinois does, isn't great, they're going to be watchable. They're going to oh, have yeah, guys on the wing that can really play. And you have more shooters now. It'll be a fun brand of basketball. I think that Illinois fans will, will really enjoy watching, maybe if the wins don't necessarily come quite yet. And I also think this is the what Brad Underwood does is a much more modern uh, sense of what current basketball fans are used to. And so when you look at what um, – what Illinois is trying to do, which is gain fandom back, right? Grab some fans back in so people are watching. Um, that's People can relate to this Illinois team because, one, they're young, they're a bunch of shooters, and they're really quick. And that's what you're seeing a lot of in the NBA right now. And so I think you can you can at least try to earn some of those fans back through through your play style. So we'll see if that works. We're going to take our last break of the evening. Uh, make sure you stick with us when we get back. Derek Rose, that's what we're going to talk about. Tati's going to be involved. She's, she's going to give her takes. So make sure you stick with us. It's Illini Drive on 107.1 WPG.
Welcome back to Illini Drive here on 1071 WPGU. I'm Eli Schuster. I'm joined alongside Isaac Trotter and producer Tati Perry. Tati. What up? Man, Tati's talked the most she has ever talked to this She's show. She's doing awesome. It's a lot. Of, it's it's real fun. It's it's real great. Um, earlier in the show, we talked to Illinois football, saddest segment, uh, as always. <laughs> then we went into Illinois basketball, talked a little bit about uh, what we expect to see on this expedition game, what it means for them and uh, this season coming up. And, and also it veered off into a long Mark Smith conversation, which we haven't had yet on this show. So I think it was worthwhile. And, and, I, and I can bet we'll have it again because... Brian Ben's not on the show today. He's usually on the show, and he's definitely got takes on uh, on the whole uh, uh, Mark Smith situation. So, but we're gonna let that rest. We're gonna put that to rest, and we're gonna we're gonna go one level up to professional NBA, and we're gonna talk about somebody who's who's close to a lot of our hearts in here. Derrick Rose, and, the God, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about Derrick Rose. The performance that Derrick Rose had last night put up fifty points. This is career high against the uh, or sorry, it was against the Utah Jazz on the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, beat the Utah Jazz. And after the game, right after it ends, he's immediately in tears. His entire team scrambles to to give him a bunch of hugs and lead him into the locker room where the celebration seemed to continue. And even Jimmy Butler during the uh, during his uh, post game, while Derrick Rose was giving his post game, even Jimmy Butler yelled out and and gave him a, a big shout out. So pretty fun. This is exciting. What does this mean? I think it might mean something. Personally, I think this might mean something. I think it means a lot. I, this kind of just shows how hard Derrick Rose has worked to get back to this stage. And no, he doesn't have the athleticism that he used to have. But basketball-wise, he is just as smart or smarter. His mid-range game has improved a ton. His three-point shot is better than it almost ever was sometimes with the Bulls. And when he gets inside, he was going up against Rudy Gobert, one of the best rim protectors in all of the NBA A yesterday. defensive player of the year. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and he did, was not... He didn't have an issue at all. He was faking him out of his shoes and putting up layups around the rim. It was it was fantastic to watch. I think... But when I say, what does this mean? I, I think that this... This is not just a fluke game. This isn't just one of those games that, that somebody has. I think, and I'm not going to go out and yell at Derrick Rose's back. You know, this is not going to be a 2011 Derrick Rose by any means. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is this is big for him. And I think that, and this isn't... Uh, you don't just randomly score 50 points. No, 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 no but you, not at all. But also, don't just throw away what, what he's been doing this season. I mean, he's had a good start to the year, a very good start to the year. He's been putting up good points. He's been leading this Timberwolves team relatively well when he's on the court. And now he goes and he has, has this 50-point game. And so I think that this could really be the start uh, or the restart of kind of his career. I mean, he's averaging 19 points a game right now for the for the Minnesota Timberwolves, and if if Minnesota decides to trade Jimmy Butler, which it's is very much a time. possibility, that really opens the door for Derrick Rose to continue to grow and continue to to kind of round back into form. And I I loved every moment of watching him play last night. He was he was looked like the Derrick Rose that we had known and loved in Chicago, and it was good to see the outpouring of support by everybody. On everybody feels good for everybody feels happy for him. LeBron's tweeting at him, Chris Paul's tweeting at him, Jimmy Butler's tweeting at him. Everybody is. It, that, that's good to see. I will say, I, I think that this, you know, you say this is, this is, you know, looks like the Derrick Rose we saw in Chicago. I would say it doesn't. I, you know, I would say it doesn't, and that's what I like about this, is because this doesn't look like the Derrick Rose we saw in Chicago. I think the Derrick Rose we saw in Chicago was a lot different, and I think it was, you know, a much more explosive player, obviously. Um, a guy that just went to the basket, but he made it work, and uh, you know, and, and we slowly we slowly saw him develop more of his his shots. I mean, we saw him get a little bit more of a three point shot as his time in Chicago kind of worn down. Um, but I think what we see right now, what what we saw yesterday from him, was just this in, in intellect of the game that that I didn't know he had, and I, that must have been what he's been working on because he didn't look explosive. He didn't necessarily look that quick, but he made it work. He was really shifty and. Uh, and you know he was he was shifty when he was in Chicago, but he was explosive shifty. He was fast shifty. This was a slower, methodical shifty. And he has a little bit of swagger. And that's hundred percent, yeah. And, and and you saw him make a couple, you know, shifty plays where he behind. It's his hard back not to have swagger when you're, when you're on the, you know, you score. What was it, forty by the third in right. the third quarter? So <laughs> he like that's the thing. He was playing at a really really high level. And he, when I was saying like that's the Derrick Rose of old, we looked at it was more like Derrick Rose looking like a star again. And, sure. And, and you're right. The, the the different form of basketball, and and that's really it really just shows to how much work he's put in to change his game. 
and to become a, a better player. And we don't see this happen often. We don't see a person no. that relied so much on athleticism completely change their game. Like Vince Carter relied so much on athleticism. He's kind of changed a little bit to become a much better shooter. But again, he's a role player at best. Derrick Rose is doing things that we've not seen other people do. No, we haven't seen someone come back from the situation that he's been in. People completely ruled him out, said that he was done, his career was over. He almost wasn't on a team he about two eight years. Points a game. Yeah, I mean he almost wasn't on a team two years ago. Yeah. That's what it came down to. I mean he was he was, you know, uh, he was Cleveland, then he was Utah, then after Utah it was like I guess he's gone. And then then he went to uh and then he went to the Timberwolves. And so um because wasn't it a situation where in that Cleveland trade he was technically sent to Utah and then wasn't he? Re- then they just released him right away. And then he was with to nobody, and that's when he signed with the Timberwolves. And so you know his, his career has just kind of turned into this mess, and no one thought that he would come back from. And he didn't even know if he was going to be on a team. And then he gets this one year option with the Timberwolves. And so we haven't seen somebody do this before, and it's really exciting to to watch it right now. And this thirty for thirty is going to be good. I was literally this just going to say I'm so ready <laughs> for the thirty for thirty. It's going to be great. Tati, give me give me your dialogue on this. I just. Derek Rose is the kind of athlete that I went into sports for. He is just the epitome of inspiring. He he went from a superstar and he was just amazing, youngest MVP, and then he got hurt, and then he got hurt again, and then he got hurt again, and it just in situations where many athletes would have gotten frustrated, which he did. I understand he got very frustrated, and it's clear. But he 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 took it and he. He changed his game, and he realized that, yeah, I don't have these skills anymore because of these injuries, but I can work around it, and I can be a better athlete from this direction rather than the path I chose originally. And um, he was talking to a fan, and they posted it. I don't remember where I read this, but the fa- he was talking to the fan. The fan, the fan kept calling him his hero, the superstar, amazing, and all these things, and he goes, not anymore. Um, I, I remember that. Once upon a time, maybe, sure, but not anymore. I'm just, I'm just trying to play a game that I love and try to do what I'm trying to do. And I thought that was so great. And then LeBron, like, in at the end of his uh, interview, said that he was a superhero yeah. and um, just all these things. And, like, uh, Stephen Curry was talking about him and how he was – just that is the in- most inspiring athlete. And I think Derrick Rose is just the kind of person I want to write a story for. I want to be the one – yeah. or the, he's just the, the kind of person that you, you want yeah. to talk about and you want to see inspiring everybody else. Move know? aside, Colin Kaepernick. Derrick Rose wants the, <laughs> wants the Nike ad now. <laughs> no, I, I – <laughs> I mean, it's it's just incredible to to watch him and see what he's done, and and you know when you have a somebody, you rarely see a guy who was on top of the world. I mean, best player in the game at the time that he was, uh, you know, with that MVP season, uh, gets all these endorsements that he does. Was the most well known NBA player really at the time, right up there with LeBron, and you know then he. He takes a huge dip and he comes back up and it, it's great to see. I love what I did love what LeBron said. Todd, you brought it up. He said, you know, a uh, a broken down superhero is still a superhero. And so, you know, some a guy who's broken down, it, you know, if he was once a superhero, is still a superhero. And so, the fact that, uh, you know, he can just he can just do this again. And you know, he, he was just laying dormant and he he still has these abilities. So it's really uh, it's really really fun to watch. And and I am going to be really excited uh, to continue watching him. And I tweeted this last night. It's a contract year. It's a contract year for Derrick Rose. So, Bulls, if you're watching, if you're watching, I don't mind it. We want him back. I don't. Hey, <laughs> Chicago would wholeheartedly welcome him back. I, I don't mind it. So, that's going to be our show. I really uh, appreciate everybody who's out there listening. Tati, you, you pin them our drivers. So, drivers, I, I love you for listening. Um, for Isaac Trotter, for Tati Perry, I'm Eli Schuster. It's been a fun show. You can tune in uh, next week, Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back on. Thank you for listening. This is the line I drive here on 107.1 WPGU.